These are my first full unfiltered impressions of how ChatGPT5 actually lands for work. Like most of you, I watched the live stream. I'm going to assume here you can go watch the live stream if you want. I'll give you a first brief look at what's in the box for ChatGPT5 if you didn't kind of read the news, but I will not take long on that because we're getting into how I actually tested it and what your takeaways should be, which you're not going to find on all the other places. So basically, ChatGPT5 is a bunch of models in a trench coat. It is a model router, and there's a bunch of Ched GPT-5s underneath that it's routing to, and it has had some special training. The special training comes out in the healthcare side. During the broadcast, they had a cancer survivor come up and talk about how she used Ched GPT-5 versus using earlier models. It really walked the line between kind of icky because like exploiting the disease versus and the experience of, of the person suffering it versus sort of talking about healthcare. From a technical point of view, they've invested really heavily in making sure that since people are using Ched GPT for medical advice, they are going to get medical advice that is more accurate than the average large language model. So that's a huge area of investment. They emphasized it. It comes through on the benchmarks. Look, I don't have a medical degree. That was not one I was qualified to test. Anecdotally, it seems to be better is the way I'll leave it. And I'm sure we're going to get that answer out of comments on this video or out of others who are trying chat GPT-5 with real world medical conditions. The other area where they are really emphasizing in this sort of mixture of models approach is the coding and applet side. I looked at some of the demos in the in the live stream video that they did, and it felt like a lovable killer. Now, I love lovable.dev. Do not walk away from this and hear that these vibe coding tools are dead. I don't think that's true, but I think that's what they wanted you to think because they one-shotted these apps and they showed how you could vibe code multiple apps and you could build them and you could just do it for yourself. It was very much a everybody can code now message. And then they brought the developers in to talk about how you actually can use the API and how uh, you have more reasoning controls than you had before and verbosity controls and a reasoning effort parameter and all of these in-depth stuff for developers after they got the vibe coding out of the way. I actually played with the coding. I played with vibe coding it. I looked at the API a little bit. I gotta say, I think that where they're actually winning is on bringing the cost down out of the gate so people use it more and on pushing the model to code more completely and usefully and to code more agentically when you're working with it. So what I mean by agentically is have it code more surgically and make more surgical edits. These are incremental improvements, but they add up to something special in the Canvas app. And what's interesting is it is not clear if adding up to something special in the Canvas app means that it will be special in Cursor or special in Lovable, where these tools are already available. You can get Chat GPT 5 in Lovable or Cursor right now. I tried it. And I felt sort of like with Claude Code in the terminal, where Claude Code absolutely sings in the terminal in a way that Claude doesn't sing quite the same and hit quite the same in Cursor or in Lovable. And I find that really interesting. We have these two examples now where model makers are basically giving incredible results inside their preferred environments, but not necessarily when you plug them in other places. I don't know if that's intentional or if there's something about the environment their reinforcement learned on or what, but it remains true that I gave a fairly complex coding task to ChatGPT5, and I asked it specifically to do a bunch of web research, to research a bunch of travel destinations that were specific and real in Japan for an upcoming trip that I'd like to take, sort of a dream trip. I haven't got my tickets yet, but hey, we're having fun. And I said, I want an itinerary and I want it configurable by different interests, like whether I want to go to Zen temples, whether I want to go and eat ramen, whether I want to go to onsen, etc. And it was a fairly complicated prompt, right? You have to build an applet that lets me figure out my travel itinerary and that lets me choose different emphases. Like, hey, I want a ramen heavy day today, right? Who doesn't? I want a temple heavy day because I'm digesting all the ramen, whatever it is. And it needs to be an app that works, right? An app where I can go through and say, okay, so this is the day, this is the narrative of the day, et cetera. What I found is that chat GPT-5 in the Canvas app did deliver a fully working app with real destinations that I could click through and use. And I actually have in the Substack a link to that applet that you can like play with it and you can see how it works. But I gave the exact same prompt to Lovable using chat GPT-5 and I got essentially the white screen of death. Like it, it technically produced some text, but there was no design, no interactivity. I would grade it a complete fail. 
And I find that fascinating. I got a complete fail on the same model with the same prompt for the same coding challenge in two different environments. There is something going on with the way they're prioritizing Canvas, and I think it's really interesting. I also found that this model, this collection of models, this chat GPT-5, all the friends we met along the way, as I think I heard someone say a few months ago, all of these chat GPT-5s in a box are better at answering in code and proving it with code and math than they are at most other things. And that continues a long time trend. If you were following the O3 model generation, that was very much how they worked. And it continues today. If you ask them the model to prove it, it does better. If you ask it to code it, it does better. As an example, I was playing around with Gantt charting and I asked the model, can you show me a Gantt chart of the Apollo 13 mission? It clearly did the research. It laid out all of these components of the build and kind of what the critical path was to the error that led to the disaster on Apollo 13. It knew what it was talking about, and this is publicly available information, but it could not for the life of it write a Gantt chart that was easy to look at. It did, it did one that was visible for launch day, but it did not do one that was very readable for the whole build cycle of the rocket. But when I asked it to code it, it was able to code that and it was able to code out a full Gantt chart I could follow. Still a little bit of an eye chart, but it was able to do it. Now I will call out in both cases for the, for the Japan travel app and for the Apollo 13 mission. In both cases, it could over index and break the app relatively easily. So I will encourage you to checkpoint, publish when you're done with them. These are little applets that are not very durable and the thing does overbuild and cause bugs sometimes. And so that's part of why I saved and published these so you can actually see how it works in practice. So much for the coding side of things. Another thing that they really emphasized was the quality of thought and how thoughtful these models are and that they can solve gnarly real world problems. In fact, that's the first thing Sam Altman said in the introductory video as he was setting up the live stream. He said, this is about making your work more effective or something like that. And then what I noticed was there was almost nothing on making your work more effective the rest of the live stream except coding, which there was a ton of. And it made me think, how much do the execs at OpenAI think that real work is coding versus everything else? Because I didn't see a lot other than saying, hey, it writes better, which was that one little demo. I didn't see a lot for everybody else. So I decided to test it. What I did was I created what I called a gnarly, gnarly, gnarly test file. It was three separate CSVs. The CSVs, and I'll share them on the Substack. The CSVs are entangled. The CSVs are not dependable. There is a SQL injection attack in one of the CSVs. They don't have common formatting. I didn't even save them correctly as CSVs. I basically tried to turn these three CSV files into the worst disaster of a test I could imagine. Like it, it's like crawling over mud with barbed wire for an LLM. I wanted to make it really hard. Part of why is because they admitted on the live stream that our benchmarks are getting saturated. And I still have trouble with real world tests. And so I needed something that felt like the kind of messy data that I see in the real world. And the CSVs encapsulated a real world scenario with employees that are overloaded and underloaded and projects that are off track and on track and the need to be auditable and the need to prove budgeting and the need to get to revenue, all of the stuff that businesses care about all in one gnarly scenario. And then I asked, I asked the model very simply to make sense of it. Basically come back, explain what happened, get to a clear picture of the number of employees on the team, which is very confusing. Find the duplicates, make sure that you catch the SQL injection, all of that, which I didn't tell it, it had to detect that on its own. And then make sure you can come back to the board with a clear picture of what happened. This is where, this is where it gets interesting, guys. This test is the thing that showed me that this model cares more about how you drive it than any other model previously, because I'd ran this same test on Claude Code. I ran it on O3, I ran it on O3 Pro, and I ran it on ChatGPT5. And not just one ChatGPT5 either. I ran it on ChatGPT5 Vanilla. I ran it on ChatGPT telling it in the prompt to think hard. I ran it on ChatGPT5 clicking the button, think hard. And I even ran it on ChatGPT5. Pro. And you know what? You would not believe that GPT-5 vanilla with no think hard 
got the lowest score of the lot. It was lower than 03. It was lower than 03 Pro. It was lower than Claude Code and all the other ChatGPT5 responses. In other words, ChatGPT5 was both the best and the worst response in the set. And I thought that was really interesting. I thought that was fascinating. ChatGPT5 Pro was also not the best response in the set. It over-indexed a little bit. The best response in the set was ChatGPT5 with the think hard button pushed, closely followed by ChatGPT5 with think hard typed in the prompt box. In other words, part of your job with this model and part of what I'm going to be doing in the coming days is digging into when and how you prompt these models for the kind of task that you have in front of you. These people who say that prompting doesn't matter have not played with this model. This is getting harder and harder and harder to prompt. It is getting trickier to prompt. Yes, if you are doing casual work and you just want to gesture vaguely at a piece of work and you're not too worried about it, it has never been easier to prompt. That is true. It has never been easier to say, I want an itinerary for Japan and just gesture vaguely at it. It will come up with something. So that part is easy. But getting really complex work done, doing something like what I gave it, where correctness matters, accuracy matters, the documents don't agree, it's a very complex context window, that takes work. Now, to be fair, lest you think that I'm sort of negging ChatGPT5, ChatGPT5 with think hard mode enabled, whether that was through typing the chat or through the button, did beat every other model. It beat Claude Code, it beat O3, it beat O3 Pro, it beat ChatGPT5 Pro, and it beat ChatGPT5 with non-thinking enabled, just the vanilla version. And so this model if done correctly, does things I've never seen a model do. Like this was a really hard test. I've never seen any other model get close on it. And I would give the responses of the think hard versions of chat GPT-5 an A minus in both cases. They're both solid responses. Everything else was, was B or worse. And so my conclusion, early on in this chat GPT-5 experience, having wrestled with this model really extensively, prompting isn't going anywhere. This model is strong at coding. This model needs you to give it really clear indicators of intent and depth, or it will go off the rails. You need to know what you need to ask for to get a good response. And so a lot of people who don't know that are still going to underuse the power of the model because they don't realize how much is under the surface of think hard or clicking the thinking button. Don't be that person. I'm also going to call out that they were right that it's a better writer. I've spent a lot of time talking about data analysis. I've talked about coding. The model's writing is the best I've ever seen from ChatGPT. I loved Chad's writing. I thought it was a great writer. ChatGPT 5 is at least as good and strikes me as slightly better with cadence and prose. It's clear. It still tends to over anchor to the recency of the prompt. So if you give it a prompt, it tends to like glom onto that and you may have issues with framing when you're trying to write. So again, it rewards clarity of intent but it is a really, really thoughtful writer, and it writes with prose that is not horrific to read, which is kind of nice. I will also say it's a good reader. I actually fed it an essay in handwriting, and it was able to quickly decode the handwriting, decode the separate set of handwriting for edits, and generate its own coherent thinking around the essay. And it was, it was a fair critique, like it was a good essay critique. So it's a solid reader. It's able to be fully multimodal in that regard. And I, I think that people who are going to be using it, who are non-coders, who are non-data people, who are in, say, the marketing world, the customer success world, the exec world where you're preparing presentations, it's going to feel like a great daily driver for that because it's going to give you one-shot graphs. It's going to give you great drafts. It's going to help you think through. It feels like a thinking partner. Now, this is where... I include the obligatory caveats or cautions. I've talked a fair bit about some of the things that went wrong and some of the things that went right in all of these individual cases with coding, with writing, et cetera. I want to call out that there's been this huge uh, backlash on the web in response to chat GPT-5 because there's been this assumption that it was overhyped, that the model should not have been given the hype it was, and we are still not anywhere close to artificial general intelligence. Now, the model immediately jumped to number one on the model boards. And also at the same time, poly market, the betting market, immediately crashed the model and said it wasn't the best model in the world. It seems like everyone's having really, really big reactions today. And not very many people are doing really, really thoughtful testing. I don't think that whether it's the best 
model in the world matters all that much because that's always a moving target. If you had to put me to the wall today and say, Nate, pick. Yeah, I would say it is. I would say properly prompted chat GPT-5 is the best model in the world. That being said, I think the important thing is actually to recognize where this fits into the evolving edge of intelligence and where we still see areas where models struggle. So they emphasize that they're working on hallucinations, they're working on safer completions, they're working on less deception. I see some progress there. It does feel like it hallucinates less than O3. I still caught it hallucinating a couple times in my test today. It's not perfect. I also see that there are going to be continued assumptions that models produce the same splash for the same reader as the moment when their perception initially shifted on AI. There is a frog boiling in the pot problem around media reaction right now. And I'm putting in this at the end because media reaction isn't the most important thing, but I am including it because I think the way we think about the evolving intelligence curve does matter. We're living through a historical moment. This model is a significant step forward in the way we interact with AI. It is closer to interacting with us as a thought partner. And I think the reduction in hallucinations helps there. I think the work done on stuff like medical where it's high value helps there. I think the work done on improving writing helps there. People are going to feel like they can trust this model more. People are gonna feel like it's right more and they will be correct about that. If you compare that to the flashbang that came when ChatGPT entered the scene in the first place, or the stunning jump to ChatGPT4, which may be hard to remember, but it was there, or the jump to O3 reasoning, People, I think, are assuming that it will feel the same way with ChatGPT5. And what I want to leave you with is this. It may not feel the same way to you because the model may be getting that much more intelligent in ways you don't care about. I think this was a really big jump on the coding side, but you may not care about that. And it was a jump on the coding side in a world where realistically, Claude Code has had the crown for a while. And so people are gonna say, well, does it beat Claude Code, et cetera? And there's gonna be a lot of debate about that. I think this was a big jump on reliability. I think the medical thing was rightly emphasized. People using it for personal use cases that really matter. Medical is a big one, probably legal is another one. It matters to get it right. And so my, my suggestion to you is that if getting medical information more correct, significantly, gigantically more correct, doesn't feel like a step change to you, maybe you should check your assumptions. Because for people making life or death decisions, it's going to matter. Getting it, you know, significantly more correct, two, three X more correct, reducing errors to like one point whatever percent, which I think is what it is on their new health bench, matters a lot. Getting writing to feel more natural to people who are trying to use it to help with their writing is a big step forward. Getting a daily driver that's a reasoner is a huge step forward. Even if people don't fully understand what think hard is without, I don't know, watching videos like this. My point is this, we have an extraordinary opportunity to use a model that is advancing intelligence jaggedly. It's a mixture of models, which is what I said at the beginning of this video. There are big jumps in many of these models underneath. Jumps in coding, jumps in writing that I've talked about, jumps on the medical piece, jumps on hallucinations. If you care about those things, they're gonna feel really, really big. If all you care about is the whiz bang of it didn't do it before and now it does it, this is not the model update for you. Because at the end of the day, it does what the other models did before only better. I think that that is fully in line with expectations. I think that we are living through an ongoing intelligence evolution and none of us know where it's all gonna end up or top out. And to me, this feels roughly in line with the ongoing intelligence explosion. And we will see more updates in chat GPT-6, and we will see more updates from Gemini, and we'll see more updates from Claude. Claude talked about it already. We'll see more from Grok. Enjoy this step in the new intelligence explosion. Don't over-index on whether you personally think this is the best model in the world or not. Figure out if it's useful to you. Use it well. If it's not useful to you, another model is going to come along next week that will be. Like, that's the world we're living in. It's an incredible world. And look at the overall trajectory. We are arguing about how amazing this model is and how much of a surprise it is when two years ago, if we had seen this model, we would all have been swearing that this was artificial general intelligence come to us out of the rocks. So I don't know. I don't really care if that's what we call it. I care whether it does useful things. I care where the real weaknesses are and I care whether it shows continued progress.
And I hope you've gotten a sense of where those strengths are, where the real world weaknesses are, and honestly, the sense that we have continued progress. This is my new daily driver. Check out ChatGPT5 and let me know what you think.